Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Thank you, worship team. If you have your Bibles, go to 1 Timothy. This is our last Sunday in the book of 1 Timothy. And then next Sunday, we're going to navigate into 2 Timothy. comes right after 1 Timothy, so you can see how we ended up moving forward that direction. Uh, today's topic is called Fight the Good Fight. And you probably noticed by your notes or lack of notes that it's Pastor James preaching today because uh, he didn't get his notes in once again. But uh, hopefully the Lord will lead us and guide us and direct us in, in filling out notes that, that maybe the Holy Spirit wants us to understand today. So I am, I'm going to be presenting this based off of the perspective of the Christ follower. So if you're a Christian in here, you've been a Christian maybe a few weeks or even a long time, this is geared towards you. If you're, if you're not a Christian or a Christ follower and you've kind of been on the fence a little bit and you're, maybe you're a guest, we're glad you're with us. Feel free. You can follow along. But it may make sense, may not make sense. If you have questions afterwards, we'd love to talk to you about it. Uh, you can come up to me right after service and, and, and we'll get to, to know each other and get to discussing what the Scripture has to offer. Bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you, Lord, that our focus and our attention can be towards you. I pray, God, that you will keep us from the habit or the desire to take our eyes off of you and focus in in culture, in people, in money, in materialism, and all the other things that distract us from who you are. God, I pray that we will lay it before the foot of your cross and that we will get back to allowing you to have full control of our lives. God, we are, are tired and weary. This world is making it even more tired and weary. But God, help us to understand that you're in control. You're on the throne. You have not left. You've not called time out. You're not on vacation. You know the beginning and the end. And you know all the in-between. And so, God, lead us as we navigate through your word and give us perseverance that we need to fight this fight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so last week was Easter Sunday. So if you were with us two weeks ago, Paul just got done talking to Timothy about the false teachers that were going on in the community there. He talked a lot about being content in our relationship with the Lord. But just in case you don't remember, what false teachers were doing is they were becoming very slanderous. They were puffed up with conceit. They, they talked about unhealthy cravings. They talk about quarrels and envy and evil suspicions and dissensions and money and wealth and prosperity and lack of godliness. And Paul told Timothy is, try to stay far away from that teaching, to stay focused in on the teaching of the gospel that is Christ. And so that's where we're going to pick up today, because he says, but as for you, is the very first verse, in, or very first sentence in chapter, or in verse 11, it's a continuation off of what we learned two weeks ago, okay? So now that I gave you a little bit of a brief update of what we came from, what we learned, now we know where we're going. So if you have your Bibles, great. If not, and if you need a Bible, come up to us afterwards. We'd love to give you one. It says in verse 11, But as for you, O man of God, flee. Flee, that means run. Get out of there, these things. Instead, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who is the testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and the only sovereign the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in the unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for the rich in this present age, 
charge them not to be haughty, which is prideful, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, to be ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may, may take hold of that which is truly life. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you, avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. Okay, so this is how we're going to end today, is through these last few verses. I'm going, to end, I'm going to start at the end and work our way back. You guys able to track with me on that? Yep. Okay, notice what it said in verse 20. He says, O Timothy, guard against, or guard the deposit entrusted to you, avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. So this is where you guys get an opportunity to participate in today's sermon. I'm going to ask you a question. What is the knowledge that Paul is trying to help Timothy stay away from? The knowledge of the world. The, of the, world. the funny thing to me is that there were individuals back then chasing culture, trying to find true riches in culture, trying to chase the knowledge of the environment, of the times, of the language, of the materialism, of the riches, of popularity, of humanity. You fast forward 2,000 years later, we're still doing that. We haven't learned our lesson. People chase knowledge outside of God. So what are some of the things that we chase here in our culture in 2023? Politics. I'm sure no one in this room <laughs> follows politics. We've turned off our TVs. We don't listen to the news because we don't care. What else? Fame. fame. Absolutely. Politics, fame. Sports, money, fashion, comfort, somebody over in this area, power, good, science, very good, what else, materialism, education, okay, now, in no way am I saying material is bad or you're doomed for hell. In no way am I saying uh, uh, politics is bad, you're doomed for hell. In no way am I saying education is bad, you're doomed for hell. That's not what I'm saying, okay? Do you hear me? I don't need letters, okay? I'm also not saying that riches are doomed for hell. The distinction that Paul is trying to make to Timothy is when we chase those things and take our eyes off of the throne room of God. So what happens is, this is a worship disorder. We remove God off the throne, and we place something else on it. And this happens a lot. This happens a lot. And we've all done it. We'll either exchange our spouse, put them on the throne. We'll exchange our kids, put them on the throne, rather than leaving God where he rightly deserves to be. We put money, we put fame, we put politics, we put sports, we put all education, we put all these things, and we remove God off the throne. It's what we call a worship disorder in the church. And this is what Paul is trying to teach Timothy, because you have a, a young pastor, shepherd, trying to shepherd and pastor people in the New Testament church to keep them focused in on Christ and yet the world is pushing so much more on them that they choose to be distracted and start following other things. Now, we get to read what's going on here, and most of us would probably go, oh, well, that makes sense for that culture. We don't do that here. Not at all. We all do this at one point or another. 
So Paul is trying to help Timothy stay in the fight. And if you've been in the church a while, you've probably have used this, this phrase. Maybe you've used this phrase for your own, your own perseverance because there's been times in your life where you've been down. Where you've been like, God, where are you? Where the situation and the pressure is so big that you need help. So you quote and say, fight the good fight, James. Stay in it. Or maybe you're a good brother or sister that you've used this passage of Scripture or that quote on other people that you know that are struggling. And you're like, persevere, fight the good fight. Maybe you've used that before. Well, up until this point, Paul has been encouraging Timothy to stand his ground against false teachings of wealth, materialism, and pleasures. And we have the same pleasures of materialism and wealth today as they did back then. So it's not any different for us to go, well, we have it worse today than they had it then. No, I doubt it. I doubt it. Several in the church and within the community that Timothy is pastoring are pointing to things that, that they think is going to satisfy, this knowledge that they feel is going to satisfy them rather than Christ and the gospel. So what they were doing is they're going, yes, I believe in Christ. I believe in his redemption. I believe that he did die on a Friday and rose on a Sunday. And I believe that he's forgiven my sins. But there's got to be more than that. So what they do is they go, yes, I believe. Thank you, Lord, for this gift and this sacrifice. But I want to add things to it. I need money. I need fame. I need more education. I need that better job. I need a better relationship. And we start stacking things. And yet it's God and God alone that satisfies. Not everything else. So think about this just for a second. Imagine yourself a young pastor leader, maybe in your early 20s. And you're just trying to bring some encouragement to the church. You're trying to point them to the gospel of Christ. You're trying to keep them focused in and not to exchange uh, the, the truth for a lie. Maybe you're young enough and you had dreams and aspirations for your life before you felt this call of God to be a pastor. Maybe, just maybe, Timothy wanted a family. Maybe at one point he wanted to get a house. Maybe he wanted some different clothes. Maybe other items. Maybe he looked at what others had and saw what they had, and he might have been struggling a little bit. Could it be that a young leader might fall victim and trap into thinking other things too? It wasn't like he was hovering over water. He was all human too. Maybe Timothy felt alone in his preaching. Maybe he felt alone by trying to encourage the church. All those things don't satisfy. But maybe they pushed up against him and said, ah, you're just being a, a non-loving person. Or maybe you're, you're, you're just trying to tell us to get rid of all of our resources to, to follow Christ. Maybe he wants us to have the, uh, the prosperity gospel, not the prosperity gospel, but the poor gospel. Maybe that's what he was feeling. Maybe he felt alone in saying that all the things that others were chasing, even in his own mind, things that he was chasing, was fleeting and he felt tired. Well, here we have the church that needed encouragement to hold true and fast on the gospel and Timothy needed some encouragement. So this, this pastor leader that put Timothy in place over this church is now writing them an encouragement letter to go, Timothy, I understand. Why do we know this? Because there's other passages in Scripture where Paul actually quotes the same thing for his own life. He said, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. So Paul knew there was a battle going on. And he knew what it meant and felt like. And he knew being alone is not the best. And so he's encouraging Timothy to hold true. Say, Timothy, everybody else is puffed up with conceit. 
They're puffed up with their own understanding. They're puffed up with their own desire for knowledge. And it leads to quarrels, to cravings, to, to envy, to dissensions, to slander, to evil suspicions. But I want you, Timothy, I want you to chase Christ. And instead of all those things, flee them and chase righteousness, godliness, faith, love, goodness, gentleness, and all the other characteristics that come when we keep God on the throne. I don't know about you, but having an encouragement like this to go, James, I know you're tired. I know you're frustrated. I know people bug you. You teach and they don't listen. But, but God. I remember years ago, when I met Christ when I was 19, there were people there that witnessed that transformation in my life. In that, that moment when I tapped out and I said, God, I give you full control of my life. My wife was there. We weren't married then. I don't even think we were dating then. She was there. My uncle was there. And a variety of other people. And they're the kind of people in my life that say these things. That when I'm tired and when I'm down and when I'm taking my eyes off of Christ and I'm thinking about world stuff or I'm thinking about quitting stuff or I'm thinking about other things stuff, they go, "Mm -mm, no. I remember your salvation story. Don't give up. My uncle, who's also a pastor, he's an old school pastor, and he's also old school Gold's Gym pastor, so he's yoked. Super big. If I call him up, which I do, and I say, man, I'm frustrated. We're taking our eyes off of Christ, and people are doing this, and I need help, and I'm ready to throw in the towel. He'll go, man up. Man up, mighty man of valor. And then, after he tells me to man up, he'll text me scriptures. It's the kind of people we need in our life. How many of you have ever thought about throwing in the towel in the midst of a situation and circumstance? Why didn't you? Was it because you had a brother or a sister that had come alongside you and go, hey, I understand, I've been there, but God. Now think about it here today. How many of you, people outside the church that you know of, whether they've been in Christ's community but no longer attend because they're struggling, or maybe you have friends or family that are struggling, how are you that encouragement to them? Or do you go, I haven't seen you in eight weeks. Or do you follow up with, hey, what's going on in your life? How can I be of service to you and how can I pray? So there's a variety of things going on here at the end of of 1 Timothy that we can actually understand and take hold of. But fight the good fight. Going God's way against the flow of this world is not easy. And I kind of picture it with two visuals. The first visual is how many of you have ever gone fishing before? Okay, so you know this one. Salmon swim upstream. Have you seen them swim upstream? How exhausting. How exhausted. Their little tail doing this, and they feel like they're moving quick. And it's taking them forever. Why? Because the current and the pressure and the weight of the water going the opposite direction is going to either push them back into the ocean or they're going to fight the good fight and make it up the stream to where they need to lay their eggs. What's it like as a Christian? It's like a salmon. We are trying 
to fight the good fight and to finish the race and to keep God our focus and the gospel our focus and the salvation of Jesus Christ as our focus. But it's hard because the weight of the world, the culture, the language, the materialism, the politics is weighing and pushing the opposite direction. This is why the church is so important to be together. Because alone, you're done. You are done. None of us are strong enough to be alone pushing up against the flow of this world. So we need each other. We need each other. Paul knew that. Paul knew that. He's like, Timothy, I'm here. I may not be present with you physically, but I am here with you through prayer, through letter, through fasting, through encouragement. We need each other. Or how many of you have seen the other visual? The wind's blowing very, very rapidly, going in one direction, and a bird is trying to fly the opposite direction. Have you seen that? And the bird's like, <laughs> he feels like it's going real good, but we're watching going, man, you ain't moving at all. That's what it's like sometimes as a Christian. I'm just trying to be better than I was yesterday. And yet the pressure and the weight of this world is so heavy. So what do we do? We really have two options. Tap out. Quit. I'm over it. I can't do this. Can't do this. Which some of us do. There was no written instruction saying that the moment you receive Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, it's just going to be smooth sailing from this point on. It actually got a whole lot worse. The moment the disciples finally understood who Jesus was, got way worse. Now, I hate to be the burden of bad news, but... It's going to get way worse, even today. When I received the Lord 20-plus something years ago, I don't even remember now how many years that is. I'm not great at math. I know it's in the 20s. That I do know. The world then, I thought, was screwed up. The world today is even worse than it was then. And if I make it to my 60s, I guarantee you the world then is going to be a whole lot worse than it is today. So what do we do? Is we, we, we go, well, what we need is, is a man or a woman to rise up and, and take over uh, and become presidents or a governor or in the Congress, and they'll lead us to the appropriate thing that we need. How, how good has that been going for all of life? Scripture says kings and queens pass away, but there's something about another name that stays true. And it's God. God is the only thing that is going to remain the same. The world is going to continue to be a crapshoot. Hate to say it, but it is. So we could go chase materialism. We could go board up our houses get some more cattle just in case we lose, lose our, our food and we have to provide for ourselves. And I'm not saying if you do that that you're, you're, you're a bad person. But what are you doing? We're taking our eyes off of the throne room of God and we're chasing fear. We're chasing humanity. We're chasing politics. We're chasing everything else that is all going to just burn one day can't take a U-Haul to heaven, right? You've heard that before. So what Paul is trying to say to Timothy is, look, they might chase those things, and maybe even in your own flesh, you're tempted to go chase these things. Don't do it. Don't do it. Therefore, he calls Timothy to have a soldier determination, to be a soldier so let me tell you this, Christians, Christ followers in here, God calls you to be a fighter. Not a flighter, a fighter. But what's the fight? What's the fight that he's calling us to? 
We just read it. Let's go back to the scripture. What's he say? Fight the good fight of what? Faith. Faith. We are called to be fighters of faith individually and together. Faith in God is amazing and yet hard. A fight where some may lose the battle here and there, but they will carry on the fight with great determination until the war is over. When is the war over? When I die or Jesus returns. I'm tired. You tired? Is your faith tiring? Is the flow of this world going in the opposite direction of where we're called to go? And I find it ironic as the church will continue to shrink and shrink and shrink before Christ comes back, and I think it's because we can't handle the weight. But what is Paul telling Timothy is fight the good fight of faith. Remember where your faith came from. Where did your faith come from? And he goes on. He says, Timothy, the fight is only over when we lay hold of eternal life, which means when we die. But see, Timothy was drafted into a war. And if you're a Christian in here today, you've been drafted into a war. And you're, wait, wait a second, I wasn't trained for this war. There's two ways, and Paul says it here. Paul tells Timothy there's two reasons why you're you're in this war. One, you were called. He says, God called you. The second is, you volunteered. So if you're a Christian in here, God called you. He said, I want you. And you're like, me? Remember that moment? <laughs> me? You sure? And then what did you do? You volunteered. You said, okay. I will, I will do that. I will have you enter into my life. And I am now giving you full control, and I will follow your lead. Do you remember that moment? How many of you are like, oh man, what did I sign up for? I guarantee you in the moment that you were called and you volunteered, you were not thinking about what will happen. But you remember that feeling, that emotional breakthrough, the transformation of your heart. You remember that the old was gone and there is new that is alive inside your soul. Do you remember that? You remember calling out going, I give you full reign and control of my life. And then the next day. Nowhere have we been told it's just going to be pretty and we're not going to have problems. We, we call ourselves Christ followers because we want to imitate Christ. How was Christ's life? Was he popular? Did he have money? Did he have fame? Did he have materialism? Did he have popularity much? No, not at all. I mean, at the end of it, he was by himself. By himself. So, Paul... In the midst of his encouragement, it kind of sounds a little weighted. He goes, Timothy, do you not realize that, that you were called, but you were also drafted because you volunteered? Notice what he says, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of my many witnesses. He's even saying, I was there, bro. I was there when you volunteered. I ain't letting you go. Not only was I there, there were other people there too. So think about your salvation experience. Who was there? Who was there? 
If you remember, you better call him now and say, I need you in my corner to remind me of the day that I confess Jesus Christ as Lord. Because as I am trying to swim upstream against a culture that wants to bury me, I need you to encourage me. Paul's like, no, 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 Timothy, I know you're down. I know you're young. I know the people in that community are really rough. And I know there's false teachers and there's a bunch of drama, but I was there when you confessed Jesus was Lord. I ain't going to let you go. The moment you receive Christ is when you also volunteered for that battle. So you can't just blame God, right? Some of us, when we're, when we're down and when we're frustrated, we blame God. You're the one that called me. You called me. This is your problem. Yeah, but did you volunteer too and say, yeah, I receive you? Well, you're part of it too. So we're all called. Well, Pastor James, you're called. You're a preacher. No, no, no. I'm called just like you. I'm called by God, and I volunteered. I accepted the call. Now, I should have asked a few more questions, but I did it. Timothy had to consider both being called by God and volunteered to think of what kind of fight he's in. Since Paul called Timothy to a difficult battle, it was good for him to know that the orders didn't come from Paul. It actually came from God. Paul said, hey, Timothy, I want to leave you here with this church. I need you to lead this church. Don't let people look down on you because of your youth. But it's God that instituted you in authority here. So what does this show us? Just this, this basic introduction shows us how easy it is to get swallowed up by culture when we're alone. It's hard, too, even when we're together. But it should show us that we need to rally together more and that those brothers and sisters that are off trying to swim this, this battle by themselves, if they're drowning, whose fault is that? Is it their fault because they volunteered? Or is it our fault too because we're letting them swim by themselves? So where does that put the ownership on us as Christians? If you were at somebody's salvation experience, you volunteered yourself to be a part of their growth. Does this make sense? The church shrinks, and it's because we focus in on self rather than throwing out rescue rafts to those that need help. Marriages that are falling apart. Well, I guess they should go see a counselor. Or do we go, how can I help you? I might not be a counselor, but I want to be there for prayer and support. And I also want you to know that if, if the issue involves you, I'm going to call you out in it because I love you that much. Does this make sense? I'm trying to get used to these glasses. Man, this is tough. Hate hate glasses. Timothy had an obligation to serve the Creator who gave him life. And the denial of God as Creator has done a wide damage in our culture. And some of the biggest damage has come from the simple fact that many people no longer believe that they have a Creator they must honor and be accountable to. He says, Christ Jesus, this was who gave Timothy the difficult command. Notice what he talks about. He goes backwards in verse 13. He says, I charge you in the presence of God, Timothy, who gives life to all things, and Christ Jesus, who is his testimony before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from the reproach until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why is he going back into Jesus' story? He's trying to remind Timothy of who he's serving. Jesus himself knew what it was to fulfill a difficult command. 
because he witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, and Jesus did it in several ways. So we have to go back a little bit. Jesus admitted the truth about himself, agreeing with Pilate's statement that Jesus was the king of the Jews. You can read about that in Matthew 27, 11. So Paul is reminding Timothy of this. Not only that, Jesus testified to Pilate about the sovereignty of God, saying that you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above, John 19, 11. So Jesus let Pilate know that God was in charge and not Pilate. He said, the reason why I'm on trial is because God is allowing this to happen and giving you the authority, Pilate, to basically lead me to the cross. Which Pilate was puffed up so much there is nobody higher than him. And Jesus says, no, God gave you this authority to lead me to the cross. How well did that end up for Christ? Led him to the cross. Jesus was then silent about specific accusations, refusing to defend himself, but leaving his life in the will of God the Father, Matthew 27, 14. So in each of these ways, Jesus made a good confession before Pontius Pilate. And when Timothy was told to live up to the good confession that he made in 1 Corinthians Timothy, or 1 Timothy 6.12, he was simply told to do what Jesus told him to do. So God gave Jesus orders for the cross. Jesus now gives Timothy orders to preach the gospel. So follow the line. What has he given you? Not only is he giving you salvation, but he wasn't giving you salvation just so you could hold it for yourself. He was giving you salvation so that you could spread the gospel to other people that need salvation. Well, if maybe most of us in here are Christian, do we need salvation? We've already received it, so now what do we do with it? Do we just hang out and go, yay, let's have potlucks and have a great time? Or do we take it and pass it on? We pass it on. Why? Because God called you and you volunteered. Paul was trying to bring Timothy back to what was important. And once Paul brought Timothy back into focus of the risen king, he wanted to give Timothy one final word to those who choose his riches. So if you had notes, this would be number one. But I don't want you to worry. I just made it through, six, what, seven verses before we even hit two points, okay? Number one, verses 17 to 19. Notice what he says. Command those who are rich in the present age not to be haughty or prideful, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. So why did he switch gears? Paul is now moving after encouraging Timothy, he's switching gears to give him one last thing to say to the church. He says, command them not to follow riches. Now, what are the riches back then? The riches back then is anything culture threw their way. So what does that look like today? Anything culture is thrown our way. We're being lied to, family. When you see a commercial for a big burger, when you actually go to that burger joint, do you get that same burger? It's an absolute lie. It's some slop and it's all like this. It doesn't look like the picture on the, vi on the, on the commercial. So we're being snowed. And that's just a burger. We're being snowed by everything. Don't chase the riches. Command them not to, but to choose the living God instead. So rich in this present age, what does that mean? This phrase puts it all in perspective, in my opinion. These people might be rich now, but they must use their riches responsibly if they will be rich in the coming age. So what does this mean? Whether you are a rich Christian or a not-so-rich Christian, how rich will you be in the coming age of Christ in heaven if you're not a good steward of what you've been blessed with now? What does this mean? Let me keep poking. It says, do not be haughty. Pride follows riches. Right? There's a constant danger that pride comes in. It's very easy to believe that we are more, more of ourselves because we have more than other humans. 
So some of you go, well, I have more money because I was better in the stock market and I was better saver than you and da-da-da-da-da, and it puffs us up. And then he continues, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but only in the living God. God knows our tendency to trust in riches instead of him. And he guards us against the danger because he wants us to trust in what he has done rather than uncertain riches of this world. The reason why the water and the pressure go in the opposite direction is so vast and painful is because that's the riches of this world. And it's all flowing into a lake of fire. It is. Then he goes, let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give. Okay, so some of you are going, oh, this is when Pastor James starts talking about money. Yeah. Yeah. Being a giver. I'll tell you right now, the church doesn't need your money. Church doesn't need your money. And you're probably going, well, where do you get paid then? God pays. He pays. I don't need your money. PJ doesn't need your money. Carl doesn't need your money. Mindy, who just started as her children's director, doesn't need your money. Sorry. You're probably going, no, don't say that. No. We don't need your money. Why? Because Scripture has been clear all throughout. God owns the cattle of a thousand. Right? God provides. Not man. So then, what is the point of giving? Why do we pass out offering? Well, all the false teachers will teach that, wow, if you put forth a blessing, God will bless you with 10,000. False, puke, nasty. And that's destroying what God's intention of giving actually was meant for. So don't chase that. I'm not asking you to do that. I don't need a Cessna to go fly me to Africa to go be a missionary. I don't need any of that. It's not what I'm talking about. And that's not what Paul's talking about to Timothy. Many think the main reason for giving unto the Lord is because the church needs your money. That's not it. It's not true. The most important reason to give is because you need to be a giver. He's making it personal. I need to learn what it means to be a giver just as much as you need to learn what it means to be a giver. Why? Because Christ gave. And if Christ gave, we give. Right? That's the heart behind what Paul is trying to say. It is God's way of guarding you against greed and to trust in other riches. When you give, you are showing who has authority. He has authority. You don't have what you have because of your good, but because he's good. And this is why if you trace back to when Jesus was was talking to individuals, he's like, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Is he saying rich people don't get to enter heaven? No, that's not his point. His point is, if you make wealth, riches, fame, all those things your idol, you'll never make it. And then some old la- poor old lady gives all that she has. And Jesus goes, you gave more than anybody. Why? It's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. God will provide for his work even if you do not give. But what happens to you? You become callous. You become a hoarder. And you know what? You end up doing it with the gospel too. If you're the type of person that hold, hoards your resources for yourself, I guarantee you you're hold, hoarding your gospel to yourself. And you're not really that impactful for the kingdom of God. You're more selfish. And the reason why I'm calling this out is because we all have a little bit of this problem. I'll give you an example. I shared this a couple weeks ago, uh, if you were here, about the story about Amanda and I, when we first got married, people just kept giving us mattresses and beds. 
bed frames and stuff, and we had like this missions ministry for a year, passing out beds and mattresses and, and bed frames. It was the craziest thing, but we gave out like 10, I think. And then, and then all of a sudden that season ended. And I went home after that Sunday, and I went to Amanda. I said, I miss that. I miss that. Why, why don't we have the mattress bed frame ministry anymore? It's because we lost sight of what's important. So I'll give you another example. And I chased the squirrel last service, so I'm going to chase it again this service just to be consistent. Um, let's say you're an empty nester. Your kids are all moved on and you have a house, 2,300 square feet. Three bed, two bath. It's beautiful. God blessed you with it. But you only really use two rooms. Maybe use the kitchen because that's important. And then you use your bedroom because your bed's in there. But the rest of it's just kind of like collecting dust, maybe some spiders. And you're like, what do we do with this stuff? So then you start thinking, well, what, what should we do? Let's talk about it as a couple. Well, maybe we, we sell it, take the money, put it in savings, put it in the stock market, and then get a small mini house of 300 square feet because if that's all we need, then that's how we live. Maybe that's what God's calling you to. Or maybe you sit down and you say, Lord, thank you so much for this 2,300 square foot, three bedroom, two, bad, uh, two be uh, bathroom house. What do you want us to do with the rooms? And then boom, you get a phone call. From a single mom who has no money, who can't afford rent in, in Puyallup because the inflation is so high. And then you go, wow, here, let me call the church. Let's see what we could do for you. Then you call the church, and then we, we go, well, what should we do? Uh, you know, we talked about this. It's not the church's job. And I'm talking the building, okay? What about an impact? Like where you go, we have two extra rooms and a bath. God, are you asking us to open up our, our home for a single mom and her child? Could it be that God is that creative? Maybe. But then what do we do? Well, the world tells us everybody's heathens. Everybody's a meth head. Everybody's going to kill me in my sleep. So maybe let's not invite them into our house because we don't want to die. And then we just let it go. Maybe that was a little extreme, but I look at it and I go, <laughs> I look at it and I go, this is what people miss. What did Jesus do? He gave and he gave and he gave and he gave and he gave. What does the church do? Takes, 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 takes. What does the world need? Love, grace, peace, righteousness. Who knows what to give? The church. Who's blowing it big time? The church. I'll be honest. There are moments that I'm like, oh, my wife is far better giver than me. I, I am always living in level orange. I'm a massive skeptic. I'm pessimist at all costs. My wife is like, So when I'm off at work, I find out she's just giving things away. And my first initial reaction is like, why would you do that? We could have sold that. We could have taken, you know. She's like, we're called to be givers. I'm like, oh, don't Jesus juke me. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. Paul's like, Timothy, teach the community to give to give. And I'm telling you, it changes your heart. It changes you. So it's not that we need it. It's for you. It's for you. It's for me. I need to change my heart. I mean, I, I was, I was, in, sorry, I'll move on. I, you got, you guys are hungry. But I was cleaning out my garage and I have this bin. And I looked in this bin, the last house I moved from. And I looked in that bin, that last house before that I moved from. And for some reason I go, I can't get rid of this. I must hold on to this and keep it in my garage until I move again. Why do I have this junk? But I never stop and think, God, 
Could this possibly be a blessing to somebody else? Could this be a blessing to somebody else? I never think about it that way. That's how selfish we can be sometimes, trying to hold on to our own stuff. Last point, Paul's final charge. It's verses 20 to 22. And I love how he says it. Oh, Timothy. Oh, Timothy. Oh, James. Oh, Tom. Oh, Rainier. That's right, I didn't forget about you, buddy. Oh, Rainier. Guard. Guard the deposit entrusted to you. What was the deposit? The gospel. Guard the gospel entrusted to you. Ignore, ignore the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith, but grace be to you. Family, look, what Paul is saying to Timothy here at the end is, look, trust God. Trust God. Trust Christ. That's it. Keep him on the throne where he belongs. Do not trust money. Do not trust resources. Do not trust time. Do not trust material items. Do not trust politics. Do not trust political leaders. And do I dare say it, do not trust humans. And I'm married to one. But don't trust them. What, what I'm saying is, of course I trust my wife. Don't trust them to be my all in all. Because they will let you down. The only one that won't is God. Let's pray. Lord, you've asked us to fight this good fight. To fight against culture. To fight against selfishness. To fight against self, to fight against irreverent babble, to fight against the riches that this world pretends to offer. We are swimming upstream. We are trying to fly in a wind that is pushing us in the opposite direction. God, I pray that we will keep you the focus. God, may we be a church that supports each other, that rallies around each other and encourages each other like Paul encouraged Timothy. May we be the kind of people that are givers of what you've blessed us with. Father, may we pour back into others because you've poured into us. May we not be blinded by culture May we not fall victim and trapped to this lie any longer. May we not exchange the truth of your gospel for the lie of this world. Keep us firm, planted. May we be the Paul and Timothys of today and worship you in spirit and in truth. And if we got junk in our garage that needs to be given away, may we give it away in Jesus' name. Amen.